and then look at why is it that we get angry with others, particularly those who behave badly, and why is it so difficult for us to have compassion for these people? First, the definition of anger is that anger is a mental factor that sees its object as unattractive. So it's a mental factor that sees its object as unattractive. It exaggerates the object's unattractiveness and then wishes to harm the object. So again, it's a mental factor that sees its object as unattractive. It exaggerates the object's unattractiveness and then wishes to harm the object. Why? Because it believes that object is a source of our suffering. And so what we see in this definition, like with attachment, and actually in general with mental afflictions, is this factor of exaggeration or distortion. And this is, I think, something, something also well understood within psychology. In fact, I've got a quote here from a book from His Holiness Dalai Lama where he says, Recently, a psychotherapist told me that when we generate anger, 90% of the ugliness of the object of our anger is due to our own exaggeration. This is very much in conformity with the Buddhist idea of how mental afflictions arise. So generally we understand that this anger is very destructive and we want to get rid of it. But sometimes there's a doubt. And that doubt can be that actually, sometimes actually I need anger. Because I need it to deal with difficult situations. Of course, there's no doubting that anger is very forceful. No one is doubting that. But what we've seen here from the definition is that anger exaggerates and distorts. And we know from our own experience that when we have very strong anger, then often we're not seeing the situation very clearly and we often overreact or react in a very inappropriate way and the, and the problem actually even gets worse. So Buddhism says we don't need to resort to anger to deal with difficult situations. Rather, you often hear Buddhism saying, instead of getting angry, be patient. And then, of course, when we hear that, we also have a bit of a strange idea of what that means. Sometimes people feel that that means, OK, what Buddhism is recommending is I just sit there and do nothing. This is not patience. Patience is not a behavior. Patience is a mental attitude. Patience is defined as an undisturbed mind in the face of a difficult situation. So what Buddhism is recommending is that when we're faced with a difficult situation, remain calm. If we can remain calm, we can more accurately and clearly evaluate what's really going on and then respond in a more appropriate way. And if it's a difficult situation, what is the strong force that we can use in difficult situations to respond? And Buddhism says compassion. Often people feel like anger is a sign of strength and compassion is a sign of weakness. But actually it's the exact opposite. Anger is a sign of weakness because it means we can't deal with a difficult situation without trying to uh, uh, overwhelm or force onto that person, to uh, forcefully uh, try and overwhelm that person. Whereas compassion is a sign of strength. And remember, compassion is not an emotion. Compassion is not sit there, smile and say nice things. Compassion is the wish for ourselves and others to be free of suffering and its causes. So if that person is behaving badly, the compassionate thing to do is to help that person overcome that bad behaviour. Which means if that person is physically attacking us, 
then we can use physical force to restrain that person if necessary. But of course, if we allow anger to get into that, we often use excessive force and then the whole thing gets out of control. And here, I think also, there is a difference between how the word anger here is used in Buddhism and in psychology, like attachment, the word attachment. And this was highlighted to me recently where I was reading a book written by a psychologist who said something like, you Buddhists have got it completely wrong. That it's not about getting rid of anger, it's about having the right type of anger at the right time in the right amount. And he said, because otherwise, how would you deal with difficult situations like social injustice? That's the example he used. And then it became very clear to me how he was using the word anger was a little bit different than what we're defining here. Because remember here, the word anger in Buddhism is the intention to harm. Whereas I think he was using the word anger as very forceful behaviour to deal with difficult situations. And so forceful behaviour without the intention to harm in Buddhism is not anger, it's, it's actually compassion. Why is it then that we get angry with people, particularly those who try to harm us? And why is it then we have, it's so difficult for us to have compassion for these people? And I think there's a very simple uh, answer to those questions. So if someone is behaving in a bad way, the correct perspective is simply acknowledging there is a person who's doing a bad or harmful action. But often when we see such a situation, we often have a different perspective. And often our perspective is, there's a bad person, nasty person, horrible person. So what we've done here is we've stuck the person or we've fused the person and behaviour together and made them one thing. That in psychology is called cognitive fusion. And it's a false, invalid perspective. Because there are two things here. There's a person and their behaviour. The person is not their behaviour. But if we do this cognitive fusion, we're in trouble. Because in any given situation, we've got two choices. Accept or reject. And generally, if someone's behaving badly, we reject. But if we do cognitive fusion... What happens is that rejecting translates into attacking the person. Because actually the thing we don't like is the bad behaviour. But when we stick it to the person, then we end up directing that rejection to the person. We end up getting angry and attacking the person. Not helpful. And if we understand that this is not helpful, then the only other option left is accept. But if we do cognitive fusion, accept translates into accepting their bad behaviour. And this is often what we do with 
our friends. We don't want to attack them, so we just sort of accept their bad behaviour. Of course, this is also not okay, not helpful. And then, of course, when it comes to forgiveness or compassion, forgiveness or compassion for a bad person feels like what we're saying is, oh, what you did is okay, I don't mind. Of course we should mind. So that's why it's very difficult, if not impossible, to have compassion for them if we do cognitive fusion. Because it seems, it feels like what we're saying is really, oh, what you did is okay, I don't mind that. <coughs> and then, of course, also, if we do this cognitive fusion and we see them as a bad person, we end up with a fixed, biased view of that person. Which means if that person then does some good behaviour, it's very hard for us to acknowledge that. Because bad people don't do good things. So if they do something good, we'll sort of brush it off and say, well, they didn't really mean to do that, they're just a bad person. So we end up with a fixed, biased view of that person. So, of course, the way to overcome all of this is don't do cognitive fusion because it's a false, invalid perspective. Rather, simply adopt the correct perspective and acknowledge there is a person engaging or doing a bad or harmful behaviour. And then we can accept the person, i.e. have compassion for the person, And at the same time, not tolerate, reject their negative behaviour, not tolerate their negative behaviour and address their negative behaviour, help that person to overcome their bad behaviour. Now, we also do this with ourselves. That if we have done some harmful behaviour. The correct perspective is simply acknowledge I've done that harmful behaviour, have compassion for ourselves, and address our negative behaviour, look to overcome it. But we often do this. We often do cognitive fusion. We see ourselves as a bad person. And then we usually end up attacking ourselves, beating ourselves up. And then, of course, we end up with a fixed, biased view of ourselves, which leads to, of course, low self-esteem and self-hatred. And this is the difference between regret and guilt. If we've done something harmful and we feel guilty, what are we focusing on? Bad me. So guilt comes from cognitive fusion, from an invalid perspective. And all that guilt does is it paralyzes us and makes us feel bad. It's not even addressing our negative behavior. So guilt is completely useless. We never need to feel guilty about anything because it's based on an invalid perspective. Rather, if we've done something harmful and we have regret, what are we focusing on? The bad behaviour. So regret comes from the correct perspective, regretting the bad behaviour, having compassion for ourselves and addressing our negative behaviour and look at steps to overcome that negative behaviour. Now... Low self-esteem and guilt and so forth seem to be epidemic in our modern society. And I think it's mainly due to this. And so, unfortunately, though, some modern therapies to help overcome low self-esteem and guilt, particularly low self-esteem, offer a solution that is still cognitive fusion. Sometimes they say... Oh, don't, you're not a bad person, you're a good person. In fact, you're a special person. Disaster. Disaster. Because cognitive fusion on the positive side also is not helpful. Because if we tell someone they're special and they believe it, then they go, you're right, actually, I am special. In fact, I'm better than everyone else. So it's a bit of an ego trip. And then, of course, when they can't live up to that label of being special, because they see actually they're not so special, they actually go further. That confirms to them they're really just a bad person. They're hopeless. So, therefore, um, on the positive side, 
And we do this with ourselves. You know, if we do something good and we think, oh, I'm such a wonderful person, it's just an ego trip. It's not helpful. But in our modern society, we have an obsessive focus on the negative, and generally it's with cognitive fusion. So first step is, of course, whether it's some negative behavior in ourselves and others, don't do cognitive fusion. Have the correct perspective. We can have compassion for ourselves and others. But at the same time, we need to have a balanced view of ourselves and others and focus on the positive things, the positive things that we and others do. But we don't want to do cognitive fusion and praise the person or praise ourselves. We want to have a correct perspective, acknowledge that someone's done something good and praise the behavior, not the person. Similarly with ourselves, praise our behavior and that will lead to engaging in that behavior again. Praising ourselves or praising other people will just get a big head. Praising the behavior will encourage others and ourselves to continue that good behavior. So therefore, um, cognitive fusion is a source of a lot of uh, problems in our life. Any questions about that? A small? Like something subtle. Subtle. Well, let's say my cousins are um, like uh, sharing, right? The brother is giving something to his uh, smaller sister and he's sharing, so like it's a good act to do. And then his, you know, his parents' reaction or my reaction would be, oh, you're so sweet. Right? Yeah. So what he's saying is we should uh, not react this way and say, wow, it's so sweet that you... Correct. Mm -hmm. So... The danger is, if you keep reinforcing that, you're not, you're not complimenting their behavior, you're complimenting them. And the danger is that they'll think that they're wonderful. In fact, they're better than everyone else. So, and here, you're right. What, instead of saying, you're wonderful, the, ne the next best is to say, you did a wonderful thing or your brother, sister, whoever. Even better, leave out the, the agent. You don't have to say, you did a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing that is. Even less likely they'll identify with it. So it's obvious that you're talking about them, but you don't have to mention, you did a wonderful thing. You can just say, wow, that's a wonderful thing to do, sharing, sharing, your, sharing toys, so wonderful. Even better. Yeah. Okay, so my next, next question would be, okay, and let's, let's say my cousin comes and she gives me a hug, okay? And then I'm like, oh, you're so sweet, right? It's, it's like, I don't have to say verbally. Huh. I don't do a cognitive fusion verbally, but I do it with all my, um, you know, my reaction is a cognitive fusion. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so if we do cognitive fusion, um, again, any sort of form of cognitive fusion will potentially lead to problems. We're not saying it definitely will. I mean, if we use the word bad person, it's just that that way of speaking and thinking can easily lead to reacting, that's all. So what I'm suggesting is that it's better not to speak and think in that way, rather speak and think in the correct way. And then we're more likely to respond with compassion than react with anger. That's all. So we need to sort of reprogram ourselves a little bit to think and speak in, a, in the correct way. And then we'll, you'll, find, you'll find that in a difficult situation, rather than the natural reaction is anger, the natural reaction will be compassion. You'll find that that will happen much more easily without consciously thinking about it because you simply have the correct perspective. So that's going to make it much easier. If we do this way of speaking and thinking, I think you're going to find it very difficult to, to 
to cultivate things like compassion for particularly people who are behaving badly. You'll find it very, very difficult, even to the point where you'll say they don't deserve it because they're a bad person. That's all. It seems a little bit like, uh, like this cognitive fusion is having the view that things are permanent, right? When I see someone act in a certain way, then I tend to think that's the way it's always been and that's how they are. Yeah. So that's part of... Exactly, because, because exactly, I mean, the person is constantly changing. Bad is a static term. So you're, you're fusing a static term with a dynamic person. Then the person becomes static. So exactly. Exactly. I find it helpful for me to add to uh, this say, uh, uh, when we react to the action, not to the, to the person, when something is bad is being done, that originally everybody has this, I don't say good nature to people, but this originally good, something good in their self, but they, they are mistaken, so they do bad actions. Exactly, and that's because correct perspective, because the same thing, we can put here, I'm just using uh, behavior, but we can put mental afflictions here. Mm -hmm. We can say people have mental afflictions, people have anger. But what do we say, you know, when anger is coming up, I am angry, they're an angry person. It's disaster, it's an invalid perspective. And in fact, on that point, um, um, there is a story, when I was talking something like this in a class some years ago, there was a lady in the audience who had two young children, I think they were three and four, and she said, oh, I do this with my kids. She said, when they started to get angry, she didn't go, look, you're angry. She'd go, look, there's an anger thing coming up in your mind. And that forced the child not to identify with the anger, but rather see anger as an object. And she said it was very helpful for them to diffuse the anger because it, the child then was looking at anger rather than identifying with it. She said it was very helpful. I heard in a, a course that uh, if you want to help someone yeah. to address the bad action, it's actually an act of pride and it can cause problems. So if you want to help someone, you don't have to help with something like that and I get completely confused. Um, I think, again, the pride will come if we do this by saying, thinking, I'm a good person or... You know, I'm helping this person, I'm a good person. I think it'll come from this. If we have the correct perspective, I think pride won't come. Or pride and arrogance won't come, because pride and arrogance is coming from this. Same with things like judging is this. And often people say, you know, we're here to be non-judgmental. But non-judgmental doesn't mean accept everything. It means don't do this. Don't judge the person. Implicitly, that means we need to evaluate the behaviour. Because people feel like non-judgmental means accept everything. Don't evaluate. Everything's okay. Everything's not okay. Non-judgmental means don't judge the person. Rather, evaluate their behaviour. So I should say, I'm not a good, not to say I'm a good person, but I did a good thing. Yeah. And this is a or even, like we said over here, if we've done something, this is a wonderful thing to do. You don't even have to reference the me. If you do something wonderful, you think, wow, that's a wonderful thing to do. Then pride and arrogance, not much to grab hold of. In the history, I can uh, think about some people who were really dead. <laughs> so we're not here, this is very important, we're not separating the person and the behaviour. That's the other extreme. One extreme is identifying, the other is separating, meaning I didn't do it, it wasn't me. <laughs> we are distinguishing the person and the behaviour. The person is responsible for their behaviour. And if someone is doing a lot of bad behaviour, often the person has a very strong habit of engaging in that. <coughs> and will this stop them from doing that? Maybe not. 
But the best chance we have of that happening is if we do this rather than this. This is just going to lead to more <coughs> suffering for everyone. This has at least a chance of working. Okay. And of course, with compassion, we need wisdom. They need to come together. And so if someone is behaving very badly, then wisdom says, OK, we need to take them out of society because they're a danger to themselves and society. And then we need to try and help them to overcome that negative behaviour, to rehabilitate them. If we can't, keep them out of society. But of course, unfortunately, what a lot of modern judicial systems do is we punish people. You're guilty. Instead of punishing the crime, we punish people. And statistics show in systems where we punish people, when they come out of that system, they usually re-offend and they're a higher cost to society. So forget about compassion. Purely in economic terms, punishing people doesn't work. It's a higher cost to society. So therefore, if we, instead of punishing people, we try to rehabilitate people, then we've got a better chance. Can we rehabilitate? Maybe not, but then we keep them out of society. Okay. Um, we've run over time, so uh, let's break there. Um, do you need more than 15 minute break before the, the yoga? Is that enough time? Okay. So let's take 15 minute break and then the yoga at 3.45, I think you're in the normal place now for the yoga. And um, we'll come back at five o'clock and we'll go back into the shamatha practice. Shamatha.